Hey, Larry, there's a guy called Larry. He goes to a revival meeting and he's listening to the preacher preach at this revival meeting. After a while, the preacher asks anybody with needs to be prayed over to come forward to the front of the altar. And Larry gets in line. And when it's Larry's turn, he gets up to the front. The preacher says to him, Larry, what do you want me to pray about for you today? So Larry says, preacher, I need you to pray for my hearing. The preacher puts one finger in Larry's ear and he puts the other hand on top of his head and he prays and he prays and he prays and he groans and he moans and he prays. And when he's finished praying after a few minutes, he takes his hand off and his finger out and he steps back and he says to Larry, Larry, how's your hearing now? And Larry says, oh, I don't really know, Reverend. The hearing's not until next Wednesday. <laughs> and that's my segue into what I want to talk to us about today, which is the topic of prayer, not hearings, but, but prayer. How many of you have noticed in the last 20 months there's some major events that have taken place and things in the world have kind of shifted around and there's been a topic of discussion that's sort of gone right across the continents around the globe. Many people in office blocks, in schools, uh, out on the streets, in homes, spend a lot of time talking about and thinking about and resonating on and to the point where it really has, as I said before, kind of gotten into many of us. For many of us are carrying something that's sort of gotten into us from that. But if you go right back to the beginning of the pandemic, um, I remember preaching a message back then, and it was about uh, what, what if this was for us a divi- an opportunity to hit a divine reset button for the church? What if this was a chance for us to... Anyone ever hit a reset button in, on, on anything? You know, it's kind of working. I've got this mulcher at home. Well, it's not mine. It's Ben's mulcher. But, um, gee, I've, I've put it through a workout. I'll tell you that, Ben. Um, I'll sell it back to you if you want it. Um, <laughs> And, and so I, I put these branches in, and it says you can put in branches that thick. So I started that thick, and I got bolder and bolder, but I got to a certain point where I put it in, and the whole thing would just and stop. But it's okay. It's not broken, Ben. There's a reset button on it. And so what I do is I hit the reset button, and it does something inside of it and just sort of sends it back to its factory default setting as if nothing's happened, and I get a chance to start again. And so I wonder whether... The, the whole COVID thing has given us a bit of an opportunity to hit a bit of a reset button in our lives. And I know early on, and, and everyone would vouch for this, how many of you drove past, um, so, uh, not Saunders, what do they call the oval here on the corner? The, what's your name here? Hepburn Park. How many of you drove past Hepburn Park during the pandemic and noticed there were hundreds of mum, dad and the kids kicking balls around a plane? Anyone notice that? And then as soon as they lifted the restrictions and said you could come out now, it's amazing how many parents and that have stopped going down the park and kicking the ball with their kids anyone anyone notice that I drive past because it's right there in the corner I go home I come to church wherever I go I drive past it and I've noticed there's a difference when we went into lockdown I talked to a lot of people and they talked about all these things that they were realizing they'd been running around in life and life had gotten crazy and they said well this is an opportunity to refocus and recenter and get back to the things that really matter because how many of you know that we, we pick up things in the pace of life, don't we? Life throws demands at us to go faster and higher and better and quicker. And if you want to break, it, there's just, life picks up a speed of its own. And it's almost like we had this opportunity during uh, the virus to slow down. And I think we've, in 20 months, I think many of us have given the opportunity to pick our pace again. What sort of pace do we want? Because for many people, the pace we were running at was actually unsustainable and so this has been an opportunity to hit a reset button in many people's lives and make the changes needed in order to reclaim themselves in their lives again in order to get back to being the person that you want to be not the person you became to get back to doing the things you want to do not the things you kind of felt like you had to do or the things you were corralled into or in some cases the things you were doing because you made choices uh, to, to do them but then you look back and go I wish I never got into this any in the first place There's no value in this. It's not helping me. As a matter of fact, it's pulling me away from all the other things that are more important. We've had that opportunity. I came across an article in the Sydney Morning Herald. It was in August 2020, but I think it's still very true today. (laughs) And and here's what what, uh, the article said. It was talking about how churches may have closed their doors, but more Australians are opening their minds to spirituality and to prayer. And it goes on and talks about how researchers have found Australians say they have been praying more during the COVID-19 crisis, suggesting the pandemic has led many to reassess their priorities in life. And who could amend that statement? And then it narrowed down on the story of one particular family, a woman named Katie. And, and, And the article said this, Katie, or Mrs. Stringer, 
said that the closure of her local Anglican church forced them as a family to assess their spiritual connection. It reminded us that our faith is also our responsibility and not just the responsibility of the minister in our church. She said, we needed to be proactive in talking to God. What a great revelation. We needed to be proactive in talking to God. We used to have this uh, thing with our kids when they were little, this little uh, VHS cassette. Anyone remember VHS cassettes? I know all of you do. I'm looking at the younger generation over there. Um, VHS cassettes, you used to put them in before DVDs and, and, and VCDs and all this stuff. And we used to have this VHS cassette called Prayer Bear. Anyone remember Prayer Bear? Anyone have that? It was a children's, um, uh, Christian children's one put together by, I think, Focus on the Family. And, and there was this little boy, and he went through the, the issues of life, but he had this little teddy bear, and the bear was called Prayer Bear. And, and I remember our boys, the, the statement that stuck the most with our boys as they grew up watching Prayer Bear was this. The little boy said to Prayer Bear, what is prayer? And Prayer Bear says to the little boy, he says, why, prayer is simply talking to God. It's simply talking to God. I wonder how much time we put into talking to God. I, I wonder how much what sort of a priority talking to God takes in our busy lives and in our busy worlds? You know, I think with this opportunity to hit the reset button in different areas of our life, I kind of have this sense or this feeling in my spirit that it's not a thing that the Holy Spirit is whispering to the church as well. That it's an opportunity for us to hit a bit of a reset button too and get back to what is the church? Who are the church? What, what are we meant to be about primarily? I wonder whether God's calling us back to a true faith. Whether he's calling us back to orthodox Christian faith and doctrine. When I look at what's happened in our country in the last four to five years, how many of you know that there's been a lot of changes and a lot of things going on? And, and, and the church still is called of God to be the church. Yeah. We're still called to preach the gospel. We're still called to, to live holy lives. We're still called to all those old-fashioned things. I wonder if... God's not calling us back to the kind of faith that caused men to look at Jesus' followers and actually call them Christian. Not have them tell them, oh, no, by the way, I'm, I'm a Christian. They looked at them and knew there was something about them that associated them with this man, Jesus Christ. I wonder if God's calling us back to a faith that lovingly confronted culture instead of trying to replicate culture and be culture's best friend. Hey, we're cool. We're the church. We're just like you. You, we, you can stay as you are. Just tack Jesus on the end of it. I just wonder whether it's an opportunity for us to relook at some of these things. I wonder if it's an opportunity for us to get back to a faith that shook demons, a faith where the, 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 the spiritual dimensions were rocked by, where, where demonic spirits, and if you're new here and, and you don't have a Christian background, we do believe that there's more to this world than what you can see, taste, touch, feel, and smell. And there's a spiritual dimension, and the best way I can describe it to you is do you remember the last time you went to the toilet in the middle of the night and the hairs on the back of your neck stood up, but nobody was there, there was no logical reason, but the hair stood up like something was there. And you looked around and you knew nothing was there. Well, that's because there was nothing there in the natural, but perhaps spiritually there's things going on around us that are happening, whether we acknowledge them or sense them or feel them or not. According to the Bible, there's more to life than just this natural world. According to the writers of these 66 ancient documents that we have had collected over 1,500 years, written over 1,500 years, bound in a piece of leather, and we call it a Bible. According to them, there's more to life than just this natural world in which we live in. I wonder if we're being called back to that kind of faith, called back to a faith that actually cures the sick, a faith that heals lepers. I wonder if we're being called back to a faith that raises the dead, I wonder if we're being called back to a faith that's more focused on the desires of God than on the fear of man. I wonder if we're being called back to a faith that prioritizes the eternal over the temporal. And I wonder whether we're being called back to a faith that at one point in human history took the world by storm. Eventually became the official religion of the Roman Empire, the empire that was ruling most of the world then. I wonder if God's calling us back to something more biblical, something that was closer to the way it was back in the beginning. Because we probably added some things and we probably lost some things. But I wonder whether God's saying, hey, it's time to come back. I want to spend the next few weeks talking about one of the most foundational concepts, I believe, in the Christian life. And it's a simple little thing called prayer. And I know we've read a lot about prayer and we're educated up to the eyeballs in prayer. Who's read a book, at least a book about prayer? Who sat through a seminar on prayer? 
Who's heard a message preached on prayer? Yep. Now, with the amount of information you have about prayer, what impact has it really had in your life? How much prayer do we actually do? How much communion with God do we actually do? It's like the, the, the parable of the wise and foolish builder where Jesus, we all know the story. Wise man built his house on a rock and the foolish man built it on sand. But the truth is they both did absolutely everything exactly the same. There was no deviation in the plan by one thing. The wise man heard the words of Jesus and did them. The parable says the foolish man heard the words of Jesus. He went and built a house just like the wise man. He did everything the wise man did, but he didn't do it according to what God said. He just heard the words of Jesus and went, hey, that's awesome, that's great, but I'm going to go and build my own house my own way. The wise man said, how do you build a house, Lord? I'm going to go and do it that way. And when the storms came against both of them, one stood and one crashed. The only difference was that one of them did the stuff and one didn't. And I think, particularly in the Western church, you would agree, we're educated up to the eyeballs in most things about God. But the reality is it really doesn't matter how much we know. At the end of the day, what impacts our life and what changes the world outside these walls is what believers like you and me do with what we know. It's not enough just to know stuff. And Jesus didn't come to the world just to give a new philosophy and religious way of life and say, hey, here's another way that you could do it. You've got all these other ones. Here's another option. And, I, and I'm just suggesting this is a better option. What Jesus did was he came down and he said, hey, the one that created this whole thing I'm coming down representing him and I'm telling you this is the way to get the most out of it. Do it this way. It's not another option. I'm saying if you want the best, you do it this way. And prayer, I believe, is something that's foundational to the Christian life and it's something that we know a lot about but the challenge is have we translated what we know about prayer into something that we actually do with prayer? And that's the challenge, isn't it? It's one thing to know stuff. It's another thing to do it. It's one thing to have information it's another thing to put that information into practice and make it a part of your world. And it's not really in, until you put some of that stuff into practice and make it a part of your world that you get to experience the reality of what God says this is for. Because God's not just dishing out information. He's saying, hey, you do things this way. There, there are life-changing benefits that come into your world if you'll just do it the way I'm telling you to do it. And God makes it very, very clear in his word that he actually wants to hear from us. Think about that. The creator of the universe... He wants to hear from you. The creator of the universe, the one that said, let there be, thinks that you're that special, that he actually wants to hear from you. And anyone know people that you don't want to hear from? <laughs> I do. I've got people and I don't want to hear from them. They want, they want to talk to me, but I don't want to hear from them. And sometimes I find myself with those people and they're talking to me, but I'll tell you what, these ears are switched off on something else. And I might be going, oh yeah, yeah. Really what I'm trying to say is I don't want to hear from you. You're not that important. I know that sounds terrible from a pastor, but it's true. And guess what? Don't sit there all smug because you've got people you don't want to hear from either. I know it because you're as human as I am. We've got people that we don't like to hear from, yet God wants to hear from us. 1 Thessalonians 5.17, we're encouraged to pray without ceasing. Pray without ceasing. Romans 12.12, 12, it says rejoicing in hope, patient in tribulation, continuing steadfastly in prayer. Colossians 4.2, we're encouraged to continue earnestly in prayer, being vigilant in it with thanksgiving. Luke chapter 18, we all know the story. Luke chapter 18, the story of the, the unjust judge, we call it. But he starts it. I, lo I love that parable because it's, it's one of, if, if somebody wrote a book, Parables for Dummies, Luke 18 would be in Parables for Dummies, wouldn't it? Because he tells us in the very first verse exactly what it means. Many parables, you've got to think about them. You've got to wrestle with them. You've got to put them in a context. And but, but Jesus just says up front, Luke tells us up front, here's what Jesus was getting at. Luke 18, 1, then he spoke a parable to them that men always ought to pray. Men always ought to pray. There's something about prayer that's foundational and imperative for believers. I'm not making it up. It's not my opinion. Do I like that? No. No, I don't, because I can think of lots of other things I'd rather be doing with my time, if I'm brutally honest. I'm a busy person. I've got lots of things that I could be doing. But yet I keep coming back to the Word of God, and I come back to this, this urging or this encouraging to me saying, you know what, you need to prioritize prayer in your life. You need to make sure that your life is a life of prayer, because there's something important about prayer. I get the impression from what I read in these ancient manuscripts that God our Father actually wants to hear from us. He wants to hear from you. He wants to know what's going on. 
in your world. And part of our service to God as believers is that we give to God that which he wants. Is that not right? Isn't that part of our servitude to God, that, that, that we've given our lives to God? And if, if, if God wants something of us, then, then part of our loving response to God for what he's done for us is that, hey, I, I want to give God that which he wants from me. I, I want to do that. It's my loving response to him, not to get his love, but because I know I have his love. You see, religion is about doing things to get his love. If you're doing things to get God's love, you're, that's, that's motivated by religion. I don't, I don't do these things to get the love of God. It's a loving response from a love that I already have. It's a response to something I already have. I've shared with you many times the story of when Jackie, so beautifully in our early days before we got married, walked into my caravan one day on the YWAM base when I was not there. I was taking her out to a wedding, a friend's wedding, and, and we were just dating, and she laid this beautiful pair of trousers, black slacks, and this beautiful, uh, um, I think it was a blue flowery sort of button-up shirt. Now, back in those days, I... Didn't wear shoes unless I had to. I rarely ever wore a shirt. And if I had to, it was a singlet. Um, I had hair down. I wasn't uh, the fashion icon that you know I am today. Let's be real. I look good. I look good. Sometimes I can't believe how good I look. But it wasn't always like this, people. Once upon a time, I was a genuine Aussie dag. And one day my wife goes in and she puts this trousers and this shirt down on my bed. And I come in, I might be a dag, but I'm, a, I'm an intuitive dag. And I walked in and I saw those clothes there and I knew straight away, you're trying to tell me something, aren't you? I'm not silly. And so I put the pants on and I put the shirt on and I, I picked up Jackie. I think I had my car at that point, picked up Jackie. And of course she was way, way impressed with me. I looked stunning. And we went off to this wedding and had a great time. But here's the thing. I didn't put the clothes on to try to get her to love me. As a matter of fact, here's the reality. If I thought that I'd had to do that to get her to love me, I wouldn't have put the clothes on. I wasn't, trying, I wasn't putting those clothes on to earn her love. You know why I put those clothes on? You know why I did something I was uncomfortable with? Something I didn't really naturally want to do? Something that wasn't a part of my world at the time? You know why I did it? It was a loving response to a love that I already had. Because she loved me that much. I wanted to do that for her as a response to a love I had. I didn't do it to get her love. And if you're doing spiritual disciplines and things to get the love of God, let me tell you, why don't you just take a step back, stop trying to get the love of God, dive into these ancient documents, go to John 3.16, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. God already loves the world. Did you know that? Every drunk out there in a pub that's bombing himself at nine o'clock in the morning, God already loves them. They don't have to do something for God to love them. God already loves them. The problem is they don't realize how loved by God they are. And, and the reality of the Christian life takes off when we understand we are already loved by God. And then we begin living a life out of a loving response to a love we have, not in pursuit of trying to get God to notice us and like us and love us. And so when we talk about prayer, we're not talking about being religious. Religious prayer is that which, well, I've got to do this to appease God, to make God happy, and to get God's attention. If you're praying for that reason, that's religion. And I understand why you hate it. Because it sucks. Nobody wants to pray like that. But when you get a revelation of the fact that God loves you already as you are, then as a response to a love you already have, the Christian life takes on real meaning and power. That's when you begin to experience the fullness of God. So we're not talking about uh, uh, praying as a religious thing. I'm talking about prayer as a continuation of a relationship we have with God. I wonder how many people, uh, this is their relationship with God. They walked up to God one day, say, hey, God, I'm Alan. How are you? God, pleased to meet you. It's my wife, by the way. I'm allowed to touch her in the same household. Um, so, you know, hey, God, nice to meet you. Really, really good to meet you. And thank you so much for what you did for me. And we walk away. That was the last conversation we ever had with him. What sort of relationship would that be? How many of you husbands and wives in this place, imagine if that's what you did on your wedding day, you stood there uh, and you just said, so you're now my wife, I'm your husband, really, really nice to meet you, it's awesome, and then you walked away and you never talked to them ever again. Rod's laughing, I'm telling Laney. I am telling Laney, that's the first email when I get out of here. She's watching, eh? Rod laughing. That wouldn't be a relationship, would it? But God wants a relationship with us. And that's where prayer comes in. God wants us to have relationship with him. The basis of any healthy relationship is communication, is it not? Well, God wants us to be in communication with him. He wants to speak to us, and he wants us to speak to him too. It's not a religious thing. It's a response to, I want to be around. Who likes being around people that love them? 
Hey, who likes to actually hang around people that love them? I love being around people that think I'm the bee's knees. It just, I just love it. I hate being around people that don't like me. I hate being around people that are critical. and picky. But I love being around people that I know love me. You know, when someone really loves you, they can speak the truth to you. And I might not like the truth, but because they love me and it's coming from them, I can take that truth. Because that person loves me. And they want the best for me. And that's God. That's God. Now imagine if you were walking with Jesus. Imagine if you were walking with Jesus 2,000 years ago, right? And you were participating in and being there with all of these things that Jesus did. Preaching with power. I mean, when Je- who, th- who thinks Jesus pre- was a pretty good preacher? I think he's a pretty good preacher. I, I would love to preach like Jesus. Uh, he just seemed to, didn't matter what he talked about or who he spoke to, there seemed to be some kind of reaction because his words penetrated. Well, the disciples saw Jesus preaching and they didn't once, anywhere recorded in these verses, go up to Jesus and say, Jesus, will you teach us how to preach? What about how to manage a food budget? Jesus could manage a food budget, let me tell you. 5,000 people, a couple of fish, a couple of bits of bread and he fed them all. Now, if you, anyone, an administrative type person here, pull that one off. Jesus could manage a food budget. Yet with all of that, I'm sure amongst the disciples there were some administrative-minded, management-minded people, yet none of them made their way up to him. He said, Jesus, can you just teach us how to manage a food budget like that? How can we do that? Jesus cleansed lepers. Imagine that, walking up to a leper and just praying for them and, and, and not praying and then going, oh, go away and just believe in faith. That would happen right there. And they watched this happen. And they never said, Jesus, would you teach us how to cleanse a leper? They didn't do it. Not that I can find in here. Not that the Holy Spirit wanted recorded anyway. Casting out demons. Jesus will cast out demons. And yet the disciples didn't say to Jesus, teach us to cast out demons. In fact, it's in Luke. It's interesting how they discovered that. They actually discovered that by accident. They went out preaching one day. Do you remember the story? They went out preaching and they come. Jesus gathers them back and says, Give me, tell me what happened. They go, oh, we preach. And, blah, blah. And, they say, and guess what? Even the demons are subject to us in your name. That's when Jesus says, hey, don't be excited about that. Be excited that your name's written in the Lamb's Book of Life. But the point is this. They're they're saying to him, you didn't tell us that. You didn't tell us. You were just walking down the street having a conversation. I said, hey, do you remember what Jesus told us? The next thing the guy behind me fell on the floor and started farming. What? (laughs) Jesus. Ah! Oh, boys, look at this. Jesus. Ah! (laughs) They just learnt it. They never asked him, Jesus teaches how to cast out a demon. The ability to stand on what Jesus believed, even when it went against popular opinion. They didn't say, Jesus, can you teach us how to have that rod of iron in our back? They didn't ask. At least it's not recorded. The Holy Spirit didn't keep that one there for us. How about the ability to raise the dead? Now, if I was with Jesus at that moment, that point of Lazarus, I would have had my notebook out and I would have been taking notes. And I would have sat Jesus down and God, that's the one. That's what I want. Teach me that. But they didn't. But they did ask him to teach them how to pray. Luke 11, verse 1. You find it in Matthew 6, he teaches them as well. But in Luke 11, 1, now it came to pass as he was praying in a certain place. When he ceased, when he finished, one of his disciples said to him, Lord, teach us to pray, as John also taught his disciples. Teach us to pray. There's something about prayer that is foundational and was foundational to everything Jesus did. And we know that. You go through Matthew, Mark, Luke and John, you'll see many occasions Jesus went up to a mountainside to pray. Jesus took time out to pray. Jesus took time to commune with the Father. Jesus prays for us in, in, in John 17, you'll, 16, 17. You'll see prayers there where he prayed for the church back then and where he prays for all believers, which is you and me. There was something about Jesus' prayer life that was foundational to the power and everything that he did. See, the power of the Christian life is found in prayer. In other words, if you get your prayer life flowing, everything else will follow. And I actually believe that. If you get a prayer life going, then then it's amazing how much other stuff will begin to fall into place. If you can just get a prayer life actually happening. How many of you know that's easier said than done? How many of you have have maybe New Year's Eve resolution has been, I'm going to pray for 20 minutes every day. That's your New Year's resolution. You lasted about four days. But it's okay because you know there's going to be another Christmas and hopefully you'll be here. And so you'll do it again. I'm the only person. Okay, that's awesome. I don't mind. I'll bear my all to you and I'll be humble. Martin Luther once said this, to be a Christian without prayer is no more possible than to be alive without breathing. 
What a powerful statement. To be a Christian without prayer is no more possible than to be alive without breathing. Question to you today, do you have a desire today to learn to pray? Do, do you have a desire today to pray? Is there something in you? I'll, I'll guarantee as I'm talking right now, there'll be, something, there'll be two things going on inside you. One part of your spirit will be high-fiving and going, you know what, I know, deep down inside, I've been around church long enough, I've read enough books, been to enough conferences, I know what the preacher's saying today is actually true. I know that prayer is important. I've read these ancient documents. I know prayer is important. I can't escape it. I can't justify the fact that I don't need it. There's no way I can do that in my spirit. I know that this is true, and I know I need to learn to pray. But then there's the other side, that flesh side, isn't there? That battle that rages within us that goes, yeah, when? But I've got all this on. And then you'll have that other side going, that's not that important. You're getting religious. Don't become too religious. You start prioritizing anything spiritual, it's religion. No, I don't think it always is. These guys, the early church, they seem to prioritize certain things. And I don't see anybody in there accusing him of religion. But I do see incredible power. I do see growth of the church and I do see things happening. And I do see the kingdom of God advancing. I do see change taking place in the world around them. I see trials and tribulations and pressure. I don't see perfect lives. I don't see guys that had it easy. I see guys thrown in prison, guys guys getting martyred for their faith. I see all that, but I also see their lives making a difference for God. I see that every time I pick up the pages of this book. A prayerless life is a powerless life. And Jesus wants us to live a life connected to his power. 1 Corinthians 9, 24 to 27. Here's what, 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 um, what Paul writes to the Corinthian church. He says, Do you know, do you not know that those who run in a race all run? But one receives the prize. Run in such a way that you may obtain it. And everyone who competes for the prize is temperate in all things. Now they do it to obtain a perishable crown, but we for an imperishable crown. Therefore I run, not with uncertainty. I fight, not as one who beats the air, but I discipline my body and bring it into subjection, lest when I preach to others, I myself should become disqualified. Discipline gets a really, really bad rap, doesn't it? Especially in church world. We don't like the word discipline. Too often, discipline equals religion. And you know what, people? It's not true. It's just simply not true. Discipline does not equal religion. What Paul's talking about here is not the discipline of an authority figure coming down hard upon you because you underperformed or didn't do something right. Like a parent to a child who misbehaved. He's not talking about that. What he's talking about is the inner discipline where you discipline yourself for the benefit of whatever it is that you value or you see is worthwhile. He's talking about you disciplining yourself and, and, and subjecting yourself. Some of the language around this, I don't want to get into it now, but you go back in the Greek, the language around this passage is quite aggressive, violent, and amazing, all wrapped into one. But discipline, it's talking about disciplining yourself for a higher purpose. Now, Paul, interestingly, Paul doesn't tell him to run like any other athlete, by the way. He doesn't say that. He says, run like the winner. He's not just saying, run, look at every athlete. He's saying, don't look at every athlete. He's saying, look at the winner. He says that. Don't you know those who run, all run, but only one gets the prize. Run in such a way that you may obtain it. In other words, run like the winner. Don't, 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 don't run like the guy that came second or third. Nothing wrong with that. But he's saying, have a look at the guy that won it. Because the guy that won it disciplined himself to achieve something. He, he, he saw something of earthly value and he wanted it so bad. And, and, and by the way, the Ithmian Games was, was the second biggest sporting event to the Olympic Games. The Ithmian Games was run in Corinth. A lot of the sporting analogies are around the Ithmian Game concept. And we've talked about that before. But a lot of these, it's not like the NRL today where they went behind closed curtains and trained and nobody saw it. These guys were training in public view. Some were running down the streets. Some were out in the fields. These guys trained in public. So you saw what these guys put themselves through in order to get a, a, a crown of, Dry flowers. It sounds pitiful, doesn't it? But it meant so much because there were a lot of other benefits that came with winning some of these prizes, by the way. But he says, I don't want you just to run like everybody else. I want you to run like the winner. He's calling you to run like the winner. Run like the winner. See, for discipline to be possible, the first step is to get control over your own self. And bring your own self into subjection. Subjection, by the way, that word there means to lead away into slavery. 
or to claim as one slave. So when Paul says, I discipline my body, what he's saying is I actually take control over my own desires and my own whim. A little bit like, remember when Jesus uh, was praying in Gethsemane, called the disciples uh, out, and then he grabbed three of them, Peter, James, and John. He said, come a bit further with me. Then he bared his heart to them, and he said, hey, I'm struggling with this. It's a hard one, but it's the Father's will, so I'm going to do it. And then he said, stay here and pray. He walks away, and then he comes back, and what are they doing? They're sleeping. They're sleeping. And then Jesus says to them, hey, pray lest you fall into temptation. Pray lest you fall into temptation. And then he says this, the spirit's willing, the flesh is weak. And every single one of us have that battle. And when it comes to prayer, it's so real. And I believe that's because the flesh doesn't see the value in prayer, which is eternal. And so the flesh will be happy to be disciplined for the sake of a temporal prize, but it doesn't understand. It doesn't want to be disciplined for the sake of something eternal. But you have to take control of your flesh. You have to take control of your life and go, no, no, there are certain things that have eternal value in life and I need to bring those kinds of disciplines into my life. See, the power of the early church, I believe, was the power of their ability. They, they disciplined themselves in prayer. They disciplined themselves in getting together. They were disciplined in, 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 in what they did in their relationship with God. There was discipline around it. Anything in life that I do that I become good at has required discipline and I've made the decision to discipline myself in those areas. Why would I not want to discipline myself in areas where there's spiritual advantage? Why would I not want to do that? Why would I not want to do that? Prayer is not a religious thing. Prayer is a loving response to God because of the love that he's given to us and a desire to be more than just an acquaintance of God, but to want to have a friendship with God and to want to commune with God and speak to God. Now, before anybody says that I'm being religious about prayer, I just want to take you back to Genesis 4.26. We're about to finish up. Genesis 4.26, and we all know the story back in the beginning, Adam and Eve. And then, of course, we turn our back on God and we go our own way. Then in Genesis 4, 26, there's this little verse. It says, And as for Seth, to him also a son was born, and he named him Enosh. It says, Then men began to call on the name of the Lord. We don't understand everything about that. Bible commentators don't get at all what the context is or the concept. What we do know is this. For some reason, in Genesis 4, there's a reference made to the fact that at this moment in human history, people began to call upon the name of God. People began to reach back out to God. Maybe it's the, that, that thing on the inside of man where we, 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 once we exhaust ourselves, there's something deep in the heart of man. And, and anthropologists have found this. They've never uncovered a lost tribe or a lost people and not found that that people had an, a sense of awe towards some divine being. They've never found one that had no sense of awe towards a divine being. The concept of the, the question, does God exist? It's a modern man question, by the way. If you go back 100 years, nobody ever asked the question, does God exist? People just ask the question, who is the real God? Because we'll, we'll, we'll worship the God that has the most power. The concept of, of, of does God exist, that's more a modern man question, really. And, and, and people groups and, found, and, and, and stuff all throughout the centuries have had a sense of awe at the divine. They knew there was something there outside this natural world. It just in our incredible wisdom, I guess we think we've moved beyond that. But, but the world hasn't changed. Not as God ordered it. Anyway. And man began to call on the name of the Lord. Now what I want you to see here, just very quickly, men began to call on the name of God before there was ever a law in place that said they had to do it. Prayer is not a legal requirement for you before God. Men began to call on God before God ever said, I want you to call on me. That, that's what we're seeing here in Genesis. There was something in the heart of men that wanted to commune with and connect and call out to God. So when people say we're talking about prayer, oh, you, you, you're touching religious ground. No, not religious in the negative connotation at all. Prayer is not a religious thing. It's not a requirement by law. By the way, same as tithing. Tithing came in years and years before the law ever came into play. So when people say, oh, if you tithe, you're being religious. No, you're not. Tithing came in before the law, has nothing to do with the law. Prayer has nothing to do with the law. So when we talk about disciplining ourselves in certain areas, we've got to get our facts right and be smart and go back to the Word of God and have a look at what it says. Prayer was something that man did to God before God ever said, I want you to do this and cry out to me. Isn't that interesting? Prayer is not a religious thing. It's funnily enough, though, we don't prescribe the same judgment to lots of other things, do we? How many of you go to work every day? You're a religious person, Pauline. You're so religious. Paul, everyone look at Pauline. She goes to work every day. You're religious. Your work's religious because you do it all the time. And, and, and you, pro you, know, you probably start and finish at the same time, don't you? You religious person, Pauline. How many of you take a shower in the morning or before bed every day? Ben Luca doesn't shower every day. Oh, that's fine. 
The rest of you, how many of you shower every day? Come on, I shower every day. Yep, yep, guess what? You religious people, you mean you do something every day, you make sure it gets done, by the way, don't you? You make sure you do that every day, you find time for it because it's important and valuable to you and you believe in the benefits of it. How many of you brush your teeth every day? Exactly, that's right, and so we should. We should be brushing our teeth every single day. Why do we do that? Because we see the benefit for it, we see the value of it, or are you just being religious with brushing your teeth? You're too religious. If you brush your teeth every day, I'm going to call you just religious. You're a religious toothbrusher. That's what you are. What about committing to a sport? Committing to a sport, playing a sport. And Owen's shaking his head, fair enough. But others of us, we play sport. We rock up on a Wednesday and I play touch football and people do other types of things and they prioritise it. They make sure that they get there. What about a diet? Some of us are on diets and we make sure that we stick to the diet and we, we eat certain things. Some of us are doing it better than others at the moment, but we, we, we get on a diet and so on. All these other things that we do consistently, focused, we find time for and we prioritise. Why do we not say we're being religious with all that, but when it comes to anything spiritual, it's religion. You're being religious. I think we need to debunk that rubbish because I feel like God wants us to get back in tune maybe with being the kind of church that he wants being the people that he wants. And it doesn't mean becoming religious. It means falling in love with him again, understanding how much he loves us, but also realizing the spiritual discipline of prayer is something that's there for our benefit. There is value in prayer for you and value in prayer for me. And God wants us to see the value in that. We've got to stop thinking that because I decided to put, because I'm deciding I'm going to put 20 minutes a day aside and pick a time and have 20 minutes of prayer, And then you get that voice nagging, oh, you're just being religious. And then you get that moment where you go, I just won't do it today. And you know that the day that you don't do it becomes the second day you don't and the third you don't. But then you justify it by going, well, I don't want to become religious with it. Where does that come from? Everything you do, everything we do. We we all know that I, I started running every second day six days ago. And I ran one day and I didn't run the next. I ran the next day and I didn't run the next. Next day I wasn't feeling 100% so I didn't run. Guess what? I haven't run since. Because the day that I stop and break the cycle and don't allow the habit to form, and habit, by the way, is not a bad word. There are good habits in life and bad habits in life. Prayer is a great habit to get into. We're going to spend the next few weeks and we're going to pick this area of prayer apart. But I just want to lay a foundation today and let you know prayer is not a religious thing. Prayer is a loving response to a God who's already given love to us. But prayer is powerful. And prayer is an important part of our world. And if you're going to have a prayer life, like Paul, you're going to have to, have to learn to take control of your flesh and prioritize that which has importance and great value in life. Many, many years ago, I lived in India. And uh, we'd just gotten over there in India. I'll finish with this. And um, we, we had, anyone know what a squatty potty is? Anyone know what a squatty potty is? Yeah. Yep, yep. So, so in the West, we, have, we give ourselves about, you know, half a meter to get up off the ground. In India, they don't. It's flush with the floor. And so you just squat down and you do your ones and your twos and so on. And so we moved into this house. Uh, very, very good for the anyone do squats. Very good. And, and so we, we were in this place and we had a YWAM team from, I think, America that came over to, uh, to, to India and we were hosting that team. And um, Marie w- would have been there at, at the time. And anyway, this team came and they stayed in our house. And I don't know what they did, but whatever they did, it was unhumane, unspiritual and evil, they did something to my squatty potty to the point where it began to back up with water and all this paper and other stuff just started coming and it started bubbling over onto the floor. And, and, and of course, they, they'd obviously shoved some things down there that should never go down there. And so I had this dilemma on my hands. I had to clean this stuff and there was stuff, let me tell you, I had to clean this stuff up off the floor and I had to unblock it and get and it was just one of the most unpleasant moments of my entire life and I didn't have any tools or nothing to do it so I went next door to this old Hindu gentleman this really well presented Hindu man and I went over and I said uh, you know in the best I could plunger plunger you got a plunger you know and he hands me this plunger so I go back and I'm and, and he followed me back to my house and he's standing behind me watching me while I'm plunging and I've got the plunger in and I'm pushing down, up, down, up, down the third time, whack! The stick comes out and the rubber plunger head stayed in there amongst all the rubbish. And he's standing there and I'm looking at him and I can tell he's going, well, you better fix that. (laughs) And so with almost tears, I reached my hand in and I'm trying to pull the corner of the rubber just to let the air pressure out so I can get the head of the plunger out. It's disgusting. And I'm plucking away and I can't go anywhere. 
And finally, poof, oh, the plunger comes out. But of course, it lets go and comes up. And you know what happens when you pull something out of water really quickly? And I'm leaning over it. It's not good. And so now I've got all this. Ugh, but I'm looking at him and he's having a wonderful time. <laughs> really good. Anyway, once I get the plunger out, I'm looking going, well, that didn't fix it, but I've got to get it out, so I'm, and I'm covered in it now, so I'm kind of reaching in, thinking I'm going to have to sterilise my hands. This is before we were washing our hands every day with COVID. And I reach into the toilet, and I'm pulling out the paper and all this stuff, and he's just watching me, and I'm getting nowhere. And after a while, he taps me on the shoulder, and I looked at him, and he leans over, and I'm squatting down here, and right next to me on the left is this little tap, and I'd never noticed this tap. And he leans down, he grabs a tap and he turned it. And I look down and I hear this noise. And everything just goes, whoop, boom, and disappeared. All gone. He flushed the toilet. I didn't even know they had a flusher. We were told you get buckets and you throw buckets in. So we had a bucket there the whole time we had a flusher on our squatty potty and we didn't know. All I had to do was just to look up. And the answer was right there. And I want to leave this thought with you. How much muck and rubbish have you gotten into? How many situations have you found yourself in where you just couldn't fix it? You couldn't clean it. You couldn't make it better. And maybe if we just looked up and brought those things to God in prayer, maybe God could do something for us that we can't do for ourselves. It's the power of prayer. Jesus the disciple said to Jesus, teach us to pray. And I'm, I'm going to ask you that. Would you, are you open? Are you open to go back, for some of you, to a place of prayer? Are you open to discipline yourself, to make prayer a regular part of your world? Because prayer is such an important thing for Christians. Corey Ten Boom said this. She said, is prayer your steering wheel or your spare tire? Is prayer the thing that steers you through life? Or is it just something you run to in an emergency? What is prayer? See, I believe prayer is meant to be more than a spare tire. And I think God's got some great things in store for the people to pray. Amen? Father, I want to thank you for this morning, Lord. Thank you for each person in this room. God, we thank you for the people watching at home as well, Lord. And, and Father, I just pray for each and every one of us, God, myself included. Lord, as we go together on this journey of prayer, Father, I pray would you open our eyes, God. Give us a greater revelation of prayer. Father, would you help us fight through all the misinformation? God, those thoughts that, that, that it's not important when, God, it really is. Father, those thoughts that tell us you're being religious when we're actually not. Father, those thoughts that say when you feel like it, when, God, sometimes we just got to discipline our bodies. And sometimes we just got to do things because they're good and because they're right. And so, Father, I just pray for our, our community, Lord, as we go on this journey of prayer together, Father, that you would lead us, that you would guide us. But more than anything, Holy Spirit, I pray that you would challenge us to pray, not to just know about prayer, but, Father, that we would be people that realize most of what we're going to learn about prayer is on the job. Most of it's going to be on the job. This information, the, the stuff we're talking about, it'll supplement, but it's going to mean nothing if we don't go and do it. So, Father, thank you, Lord. And, God, I pray also for each person causes a, uh, calls a rise home, Father, each person watching. Lord, I pray in the next seven days, would you give each and every one of us, give us a chance to tell somebody out there about you, God, somebody at the moment who doesn't know they're loved by God, somebody who doesn't know that you're on their side, somebody who doesn't know about the death, the burial, the resurrection of Jesus, would you give each and every one of us the opportunity to talk to that person in the next seven days? And we ask this in Jesus' name. Everybody said? Amen. 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 Bless you, guys.